Hey, what's going on, guys? This is Zach, the Wretched Watchman, and welcome to Below the Surface here on Hope for Our Times. Thank you guys for joining me today, and I hope you guys uh, had a good week. And uh, yeah, if this is your first time here, this is what I like to do, is I like to dig below the surface of things. I like to peel back uh, the layers of the onion, so to say, of some of the things that we see going on. We get blasted with so much information out there uh, each and every day. Just the news just comes at us so fast that sometimes when we're trying to keep up on, on that stuff, sometimes we don't have the time to look a little bit further into things and find out where it's rooted or where it comes from or what it actually means. And uh, we can find ourselves a little bit deceived in certain areas if we're not looking uh, at those little things. So that's what I like to do. I like to dig a little bit deeper and uh, take a look at what's going on. And so when it comes to the times that we're living in, we have to be very careful about what we throw ourselves behind. There's so many movements coming at us, whether they're political or religious or, or you know, anything in between. Um, sometimes we can just look at the, the outer layer, just the, the even just the name of a movement. And, and if it looks good, if it uh, fits uh, what we believe or, or anything like that, then we just we can sometimes just stand behind it, uh, get involved in, and accept it without actually understanding uh, what's going on, uh, without actually understanding what the movement is, where it comes from, and so on and so forth. We often don't recognize the crafty and cunning ways which Satan can it can use to deceive and distract us. Again, sometimes we can just look at something at face value, just look at the name and go, wow, that sounds good. I should go ahead and, and, and follow that. Or, or we look at things uh, like when the media is out there, if the right wing media is giving us information, well, because it fits along with our beliefs or our own biases. Now don't, don't deny it. We all have biases, including myself. Then sometimes we can just go, well, it obviously that has to be truthful. And that obviously must be the case. And we just go along with it. Same thing. If we have something that's coming from uh, the, the left media or something, we just tend to go, well, it's coming from the left. So left, so it can't be true. Uh, just no matter what, it can't be true. But sometimes we don't realize that both lie in order to make themselves look better. And so we have to learn what's going on with that. The same thing when it comes to movement. Satan, again, is so crafty, so cunning. Sometimes we can uh, we can uh, underestimate him on that. And he can just put a label or a tag on the outside that makes it look good. But ultimately, it's not. And so we have to be careful about what we get ourselves wrapped up with. And one of the ways is placing the labels and tags on things such as Christian. We just sometimes he'll just put the Christian tag on there and um, we can just get sucked into it just because it has the name Christian on it. And we haven't looked into it in any 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 way in any way, honestly, uh, there's really no other way to put it. And so when we look at things like, I'll give a few examples, look at things like The Chosen Show or Angel Studios, uh, that just has Christian on there. It's about Jesus, so it must be good. It has to be good. It's Christian about Jesus and, and da, 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 da. Well, if we actually looked deeper into it, the director of the show is Dallas Jenkins. His main goal with The Chosen is to tear down the walls of different faiths and unite them together. Here we go. We've got the one world religion rearing its head. He also doesn't understand the difference between the Mormon Jesus and the Christian Jesus. He believes that we all worship the same Jesus. Now that is completely false and incorrect as well. The guy who plays uh, Jesus on the show, Jonathan Rumi. Well, we've talked about him. He's a devout Catholic. Um, he does necromancy and grave so and he partakes in a lot of mystic beliefs to go along with it. Well, he's a part of it as well. There's another actor on the show. I can't remember his name. I apologize for that. But I did a, 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 a video on it, actually, uh, where he was a director for another movie that had to do with uh, uh, so kids going down to hell to find their dog and we see things like that plus we've seen things like the pride flag on the uh, the set uh, on the set of the show as well which people didn't find that uh, problematic in any type of way plus angel studios was formed uh, with mormons there and and everything and there's questionable content within all their other Christian stuff as well, along with other actors, uh, Mormon actors and Catholic actors on on the uh, at the studio as well. It's there's problems all the way around with it. But because it said Christian, 
It had to be good, right? Same thing when it comes to the music. We've talked about Hillsong, Bethel, Elevation, artists that come from them, Carrie Job, Bill Wickham, uh, David Crowder, and a bunch of other ones, Passion City and Maverick City Music and, and all these types of things. Well, it has the Christian label on there. It's worship music. It's played, unfortunately, in the majority of churches, at least in the United States, but all across the world. And well, we just think, well, it's Christian and the lyrics are okay. So it must be good. It doesn't matter where it comes from, right? Well, the problem is, is the beliefs that most of these people hold, well, they're not true Christian beliefs. They have a different idea of who Jesus is. They worship a different Jesus. But just because as Christian in there, it must be good, right? What about things like, oh, I don't know, the Reawaken uh, America tour? Uh, that we see from Clay uh, Clay Clark and 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 all the things that's going on. Well, it's a bunch of conservatives. There's a bunch of Christians and pastors and and stuff. They're all involved with it, so it must be good. They're fighting the globalists. They're they're fighting the uh, the Great Reset, and they're going against all these things. But the thing is, is that entire thing is wrapped up in New Age beliefs. It's about enlightenment, reawakening uh, the country, creating a hive mind. There's actually so much bad about it, not to mention it is fully wrapped up and embedded in the Q movement, which is a demonic movement in itself as well. There's nothing good about it at all, but because it has conservative and they say things that we like and there's Christians involved, it has to be good, right? Not necessarily. Satan is that good that he will fool us just by putting these tags and labels on the things that we've got to be very careful that we don't fall prey to. I mean, we have to be very careful. But another one that seems to be gaining traction, at least recently, is the movement of Christian nationalists. And that's what I want to talk about today, because when we look at the name, it appears good. Christian nationalists. And nationalist, both are great things. Christian, uh, you know, Christian values, Bible doctrine, worshiping Jesus, and nationalism. You know, the Lord told us to go out and and make nation many nations, and and we should build up those nations with Christian values and, and such. So it has to be good, right? Right? Well, not exactly, because the problem doesn't come from the name. The problem actually comes from where it comes from. The term wasn't so hot several years ago when I originally left the NAR or New Apostolic Reformation Church. I got, I grew up in a Bible believing, Christ following, solid Christian uh, home, made it all the way through my entire life. But of course, I went out on my own. I wanted to seek personal things, which I thought I was doing for the Lord at the time, but I wasn't. And so I got wrapped up in the NAR church in order to accomplish the goal, which the Lord said not going to happen. But when I left the NAR church, there's a bunch of research that the Lord led me to do. And along the way, one of them was the term Christian nationalist before it was something of a hot button term like today. The roots of Christian nationalism actually come from the dominionism or dominion theology, kingdom now, the New Apostolic Reformation, and the Seven Mountain Mandate movements. That is a, what it really is a part of. That's what it's rooted in. But we can get caught up again. It's We can't put it past Satan on what he does. You look at the name, Christian nationalist, it must be good. Plus, we have the fact of you have the left-wing media that is using it as they've weaponized it. They're using it as a weapon in order to attack Christian principles, to attack Jesus, to attack the doctrine. But ultimately, we look at that and go, well, they're attacking it. So obviously, I must stand behind it. Well, we can't do that either, because when they're attacking it, they are using the world's term of Christian, which means Catholic and Mormon, Jehovah's Witnesses, Lutheran, and a whole bunch of other ones that all believe in a false religion. And they're trying to combine it all together with Christianity, which again, we start getting into the one world religion aspect of that. That Well, the left is using it as a, as a bad term against the Christians, and they mean all-encompassing, but we're not going to look at that. I'm just going to stand behind it and stand in support of it. It's trickery, and sometimes we can get caught up into that when we really shouldn't. So what is dominionism? What is kingdom now? What is NAR? What is seven mountain mandate? What is what is all this stuff? Are they bad things? Are they good things? Well, let's let's just break it down. We see those terms often get thrown around, but we don't necessarily know what they are. I mean, we have an idea, but not necessarily. 
Let's start with dominionism. Dominionism or dominion theology is a theology based on Genesis 128 taken out of context, of course. And what it basically says is it's to subdue the earth and have dominion over everything that moves on the earth. And so basically they take this out of context and they believe that their job is to hold dominion over the entire earth. That means to take over every aspect of every nation across the earth and subdue it entirely. So they take it to a whole nother level of what that actually means. Now, coming along with it is the belief that certain leaders, certain specific leaders of the dominionism are given divine authority to obtain positions of power in order to make it happen. So it can't just be anybody that takes over certain positions and, and uh, begins to subdue uh, certain parts of leadership in those nations. It can't be anybody. It has to be certain handpicked people that God has given divine authority for them to take that specific position. And so we start getting into the thing of, well, God's picking certain people and giving them certain divine authority in order to take over these spots. People can help these leaders get to those positions and they can help in lower levels, but it has to be those divine leaders to take those positions. Now, dominionism, obviously we see is well, wrong, uh, not good. But dominionism is basically the foundation for something moving it to the next level, which is the kingdom now theology, which blends into the NAR or New Apostolic Reformation. So what is kingdom now? Kingdom now uh, basically steps it up a notch from, domin div uh, from dominionism by believing through the dominion theology, it's our job to build the kingdom of God here on earth. And once we complete that task, once we build that kingdom, once we have dominion over every single nation, then Jesus Christ is going to come down to and take his spot on the throne and rule. So, Basically, in order for this to happen, uh, they believe, I believe it's back in 70 AD, the millennium, millennial kingdom basically started. So we're already in the millennium kingdom at this point, millennial kingdom, which, okay, sure. Um, but so they believe that that's already happened. So we're at this point now where we have to build the kingdom of God. And then when it's ready, Jesus will come down and take his spot to rule taking this foundation and bringing it to a more emotional and experience driven uh, setting is the NAR, which basically helps propel this into the Pentecostal and the char charismatic churches out there. And basically what their job is to do is to help set up this kingdom to build this kingdom, but they're doing it for with a much more um, softer approach. Because when you look at things like dominionism, it's like dominionism, you know, it sounds hardcore. And so what they do is they try and make it so it's a little bit more appetizing for people. And then they start bringing in more of the emotional stuff where it's the touchy feely softness, uh, kind of like how they create their modern worship music type of thing, as well as experience based. And a lot of that has to do with is the NAR, the they believe that God reopened the office of the apostles. And so now there are new apostles, kind of like the divine leaders of dominionism. Well, the NAR believes that the office of the apostle is open and coming with it is that divine authority, along with the apostolic gifts of things like prophesying and raising people from the dead and healings and, and all these types of things. So that's why when we see uh, people like Todd White and Benny Hinn out there trying to heal people and whatnot, even though it's a big show, that's where we see that coming from. Uh, they're putting on the experience based of it, along with a whole bunch of other occultic um, and uh, satanic demonic practices of witchcraft and, and all that stuff as well. And then, you know, you have places like Bethel that opens like the Hogwarts school of witchcraft uh, and supernatural uh, stuff where their job is to try and teach people how to do these types of things in order to help propel and build the kingdom of God. That's why you see a lot of these NAR churches like Hillsong. They do like the as it is in heaven, so it is on earth type of thing. They take that out of context as well. And what they mean by that is we have to build the kingdom of heaven here. So as it is in heaven, we must build it here type of thing. And then you see a bunch of uh, worship songs and lyrics and stuff where they're talking about build your kingdom here and whatnot. They're not talking about you know, in the biblical sense of what the Bible actually tells us, they're talking about we have to build the kingdom here. And so when you look at 
I was talking about how you have these worship stuff where you just think, oh, the lyrics fit biblically, so it must be fine. But the thing is, is the same people who have a twisted, a warped view of the Bible and Bible doctrine and Jesus, and they take things out of context to make it fit. Well, then when you understand where they're coming from on that level, and then you look at the lyrics, they go, oh, maybe these lyrics are actually a bit more twisted than what I originally thought. And now we have a problem. You see how, you know, Satan is so cunning at getting these things across in that type of way. So that's dominionism. That's kingdom now. That's NAR. They're the ones that are helping propel this. Now, here's here's where things just don't make sense. We know as Bible-believing, Christ-following uh, people who watch for or prophetic signs and whatnot, the world is and will get worse. End of statement. I mean, that's just how it's going to be. We understand that things are getting worse and they will continue to get worse as we get closer to the rapture and the day of the Lord where God's going to pour out his wrath. It's going to get worse. For them, they believe that things are and will get better. I invite them to just open their window and take a look outside. Tell me how on earth things are and will get better and they, as they continue to get worse. It doesn't make any sense, but that's what they believe. And in order for these things to get better, they have to do their job of subduing the earth, putting dominion over every nation, and building the kingdom of God. Again, it just does not make sense. So Christian nationalism, let's get back to that. Where does it come from? What, 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 how, how does it operate? What, what's going on? So Christian nationalism with the backing idea of subduing seven specific things are, are, is basically there to get dominion over the earth. So through seven specific areas, they will go ahead and subdue the earth. And this is where the Christian nationalism stuff comes in. So what are the seven areas that they must... Uh, conquer, so to say, in order to have dominion over each nation. Well, that would be the seven mountain mandate. So we take a look at this. Seven mountain mandate means they have to control uh, the uh, all the areas of business, of government, of the family and the home, of religion or the church, of media, of education and of entertainment. If they can uh, grab a hold and and subdue all seven of those areas in a nation, then they will have subdued it and they will have dominion over that nation. Their goal is to obtain all of those positions in every nation across the world in order to build the kingdom. So this is what we see. And so when we see these leaders out there, whether they're religious, government, uh, in the political or the entertainment area and media or anywhere of these, these areas, whenever we see leaders in these areas who pr profess to be Christians, but yet they dedicate their lives to nothing but fighting the globalists, gaining political power and, and campaigning for such things or, or trying to take over cult areas of culture and stuff like that. When they dedicate their entire lives to that while they claim to be Christian and commanding others to support them and to do the same all the while they are ignoring what we're supposed to do, which is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and win souls to Jesus. They're the ones who are the Christian nationalists. They are the ones who proclaim to be Christians, but they dedicate their lives to accomplishing their own selfish goals. That's a true Christian nationalist because they're trying to get into all seven of those areas. And their goal isn't to share the gospel. Their goal isn't to win souls to Jesus. Their, their goal isn't to help people find salvation and hope in Jesus Christ. Their goal is to obtain a position of power. And they want you to help them do that, whether it's voting or financial backing or campaigning or any, any type of thing that you want to do. Their goals, again, are not to win souls, but their goals are to use Christians, churches, and the name of Jesus to accomplish their own selfish goals. Be warned of people that fall into this camp. People like Sean Foich and Greg Locke, Paula White, Amanda Grace, all their connections to the NAR, to the mystic, to the occultic, and all those things. Be warned of people like Michael Flynn with his connection to theosophy and the Q movement. And be cautious of those who only stand on Christian principles when it benefits them in their campaign. But then all of a sudden they'll 
bend and push those Christian principles aside in order to obtain the support of those that don't follow the same belief system. I'm sure you can think of a few that fit the bill. I know I can. I'm sure you can think of a few. All these people are seeking for man to save them. They're looking to awaken the nation, which is a new age term of reaching enlightenment to build a hive mind to awaken the nation. They believe that a revival is happening, but the problem is, as the Bible talks about, now is the time when there's going to be the falling away, the revealing of who is true and who is not is happening, where more and more people are turning away from Jesus, are turning away from Christian principles, and they're turning to more selfish things. That's what the time that we're living in. But to them, they think that there's revivals happening. That's why when we see these quote unquote revivals pop off, like the Ashbury revival and, and some of these other ones as well, who are the first people to support it and go on the offensive for those who have questions about it? It's the Christian nationalists because they believe that that is fitting their desires, their campaign, their beliefs of dominionism. They are preparing for the Antichrist, just like everybody else in this world is, they're looking for a man, a leader, a political savior to step on the scene and to help fix the problems. Well, for us who read the Bible, we understand that that next one that's going to step up to do that is going to be the Antichrist. And they're ready to go. They've got the mindset ready to accept him. So, the Seven Mountain Mandate, where does it come from? It depends on who you ask. There seems to be two origins, but we're going to take a look at both just so we don't miss anything. First up is a guy by the name of Lauren Cunningham. Cunningham, used, uh, he was the founder of Youth with a Mission and said that he received a list of seven mandates divinely given to him by God in order to prepare the nation for Jesus. Hmm, interesting. In his 1988 book called Making Jesus Lord, he wrote about this. And he said, sometimes God does something dramatic to get our attention. That's what happened to me in 1975. My family and I were enjoying the peace and quiet of a borrowed cabin in the Colorado Rockies. I was stretched out on a lounge chair in the midday warmth, praying and thinking. I was considering how we Christians, not just the mission I was a part of, but all of us, could turn the world around. For Jesus. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. No, does it? It goes on to say, though, a list came to my mind, categories of society, which I believe should focus on in order to turn nations around to God. I wrote them down and stuck them in the, uh, the paper in my pocket. The next day, I met with a dear brother, the leader of Campus Crusade for Christ, Dr. Bill Bright. We'll get to him in just a second. He shared with me something God had given him as well. Several areas to concentrate on to turn the nations back to God. Oh, how convenient. They were the same areas with different wording here and there that were written on the page in my pocket. I took it out and showed Bill and we shook our heads in amazement. Now, it's important to understand that sometimes we, whenever we see something like this, we automatically think it has to be from God. But we have seen things in the past, things like Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey and Napoleon Hill and, and several others, a bunch of others, actually, where they all thought it was something divinely given to them by God, but ultimately it was demonic in nature. We have to understand that Satan is able to do these, these signs and wonders and, and give illusions and whatnot. We have to be very careful that we truly understand if it's from God or from Satan. And in this case, when we look at the seven mountain mandate, we know that this is not from God, unlike what they believe, though. This list is supposedly that seven mountain mandate that God gave both Cunningham and Bill Bright. So who's Bill Bright? Let's take a look. Bill Bright was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, as he said in the book, and was also influenced by Billy Graham. Besides the divine instruction, apparently, of the seven mountain mandate, my concerns extend further with his Templeton Prize winnings for progress in religion. This comes from John Templeton, who was one who was trying to uh, help fund and give grants and money and support for people who were trying to unite faiths to create a one world religion uh, because he didn't believe that there was one way to heaven and he wanted to progress to change and evolve religion 
into one uniting faith, the one world religion. And Bill Bright was a winner of one of his awards. Let's just take a look. Established in 1972, the Templeton Prize was celebrated uh, was celebrated investor Sir John Templeton's first major philanthropic venture. He created the Templeton Prize because he wanted to recognize discoveries that yielded new insights about religion, and he set the award amount above the Nobel Prize in order to recognize the importance of what he called progress in religion, to move it forward, to change it. Remember, God never changes, and neither does his word. His understanding of progress in religion evolved during his lifetime and is shown in the variety among the 53 laureates who have received the prize. Winners have come from all major faiths and dozens of countries that have included Nobel Prize winners, philosophers, the theoretical physicists, and one canonized saint. Hmm. Interesting. Throughout the decades, the prize always reflected Sir John's core conviction that there is a deeper level of reality or enlightenment, new knowledge, uh, Gnostic belief, esoteric. That's the best way to put that, a deeper, deeper level of reality that can be accessed through rigorous research, especially in the sciences. Hmm. For the first few decades of the prize, HRH Prince Philip presented the award and distinguished leaders such as the Dalai Lama, uh, Margaret Thatcher, and Presidents George H.W. Bush and Gerald Ford served as judges. Yes, those were the same people who were judging on the progress in religion. Concerning, isn't it? Who are some of the award winners of this thing, you ask? Let's take a look. Mother Teresa, hmm, Billy Graham, oh really, there's Bill Bright, and then there is the Dalai Lama. There's a bunch of other ones on there. They, they all range from uh, metaphysical uh, uh, believers to uh, psychologists to Catholics to Hindus and Buddhists, and, and so, I mean, it, the landscape is large. And they all won prizes from John Templeton because he believed that those people were helping progress towards the one world religion. Interesting, isn't it? And there's Bill Bright, one of the people who apparently said that God gave him the seven mountain mandate. Interesting. Very interesting. So let's go ahead and jump over to the next origin, shall we? It comes from a guy by the name of Lance Walnow. Walnow also said that the seven, mount, uh, the seven mandates were divinely given, uh, just like Cunningham and Bright. Let's see what else Walnow says on his blog. Now, this is what he wrote on his own blog. And it says, nearly 20 years ago, I began to hear God tell me about the seven mountains and a movement that was coming. I fell out of rhythm with the revival theme, but I knew the seven mountain mandate or the seven mountain message had the power to change everything when properly understood. I believe that the reason God entrusted me with the seven mountain me message is because of something Kim Clement taught about hearing God's voice. If you guys don't know Kim Clement, he was one who was a false prophet. He claimed that he received all these different visions and, and uh, divine revelation, new revelation uh, from God, which we understand the book of revelation says curse anyone or um, adds or removes from this book shall be cursed. And uh, that's, Basically, Kim said, no, I'm getting extra revelation, extra prophecy uh, from God, which that is not happening. Now, some people say that he repented at the end of his life. I certainly hope so. I don't want anybody to go to hell. And so I hope that he repented and he came to a true salvation through Jesus. But that does not mean that all of the false prophecy work that he was doing beforehand is still not making waves across the world as we see right now. And so he's talking about how uh, Clem, Kim Clement, or Clement taught about hearing God's voice. Kim said that he believed his willingness to give what God told him to help activate his gift. This is a new age uh, spirituality, mystic belief of activation and manifestation in this stuff. And we see it all throughout this. When I started sowing into Kim's ministry, it was because I wanted to hear God like Kim. However, when I started hearing God, it was a little confusing. You see, the spirit you sow into will impart to you an activation of what's inside of you. More new age mumbo jumbo. Because I wasn't Kim, my hearing of God's voice took me to a unique direction and we can go through here and he's talked and he was talking about how god uh 
he started asking God for a specific amount of money uh, to put in when Kim was preaching and Annab Annabelle was with him, started challenging him. And then all of a sudden they started getting the same numbers and they believed that it was, uh, you know, something, a, a message, a sign from God. And then Lance Wall now started working into uh, working on Kim's ministry and started teaching at his church and everything like that. But then if we go to the bottom, it says, after reading this, uh, reading this years ago, I realized that I was caused, uh, called to communicate or connect with the teaching by sowing into the anointing. After I did that, my own ministry started to explode with activation. We've got more of the new age belief going on with this. There's a lot of concern with this. You're seeing mysticism and the apostolic gifts of divine revelation and prophesying starting to come about, all of which are things that the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation, promotes and again attempts to teach at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Supernatural and all that, all that jazz. Let's take a look a little bit further of uh, Wal uh, Walnow's biography on his website. It says Lance Walnow. Uh, USA Today described him as one of only three evangelical leaders who accurately predicted Donald Trump's presidency from the moment he began his campaign. We got some Christian nationalism popping up here, guys. His best-selling book, God's Chaos Candidate, which is about Trump, of course, broadcasts and viral media influenced three to five million undecided evangelical voters. His prediction that Trump would be the modern day Cyrus, woo, interesting, was challenged by left wing news outlets, but vindicated on March 5th, 2018, the day that Prime Minister Netanyahu met with President Trump at the White House to thank him for his historic embassy decision, linking him to Cyrus. Hmm, the New York Times op ed quoted Lance, could Trump be God's Cyrus? A lot of concerning things. Uh, Dr. Walnow is a strate uh, strategist, futurist, and compelling communicator who has uh, shared platforms with Ben Carson, Mike Pompeo, and best-selling authors Ken, uh, Ken Blanchard and John Maxwell. He has conducted training for the United Nations. That's concerning. Spoken at Harvard, not good. The Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, China, and the London School of Theology. Hmm. With a 30-year background consulting business and nonprofits, Lance students represent a global tapestry spanning governments, CEOs, entertainers, and entrepreneurs. That's right. Reach those seven mountains with your Dominion theology. Hmm. A lot of concerns. There's more, though. If we jump over to the International School of Ministry, or also known as ISOM, we'll see Wall now has a class designed specifically for the Seven Mountain Mandate. That's right. You can get taught about the Seven Mountain Mandate straight from Mr. Walnow himself. But don't worry. There are plenty of wonderful sound teachers at ISOM, like Joyce Meyer and Perry Stone, Christine Kane, Gloria Copeland, and the uh, original Hillsong musician uh, leader, Darlene Zeck. Wow. We got some, some class act there. That's sarcasm, guys. Just, just going, just making sure you all understand what's going on with that. You'll also find a dedicated course on ISOM about the NAR directly, where you'll learn things about the new apostolic reformation, about dominion theology, the apostolic governance. Hey, there's the office of the apostle again, the office of the prophet. That's right. Aligning with God's will and exercising dominion, understanding the kingdom of God's teaching and relevance, the role of apostles and apostolic alignment, acquiring your own divine power and fulfilling your unique role, making disciples of nations, and on and on and on and on it goes. You see the problem? Do you see this? how this isn't good? This is where Christian nationalism comes from, guys. Just because the name looks good does not mean that we need to be backing it. We tend to jump the gun on some of this stuff. We tend to just look at the surface level. We tend to just look at the name. And just because maybe somebody that we don't like is using it as a weapon or somebody that we do like is promoting it, we just naturally go along with it. But we have to look further into these things. Now, if you want to know more about this, you can head over to my channel and I've got a podcast called Seven Mountains where I go even further and even deeper um, into this to give you more uh, uh, information about what it comes from. But we really got to understand that just because it looks good, just because it has the tag of Christian or it fits our own personal beliefs and biases does not mean that Satan is not using it as a way to deceive 
and distract. And Christian nationalism is certainly one of those things. Our goal as Bible believing Christ followers, we understand that it, things are going to get worse. Now we have to stand for righteousness, obviously, but our goal should not to try and get dominion in all of these areas. Our goal specifically that God commands us, our blessed generation, is to do two things, is to warn people of what is coming and to warn people of stuff like this, and most importantly, spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because as we get closer to the rapture and into the day of the Lord, these things are going to increase. These convergence of signs are going to increase. The darkness is going to get even darker and thicker. And that means we're running out of time to get as many souls as we can to Jesus. Make that your mission, not to be a Christian nationalist, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we need to focus on. Thank you guys for joining me today. And uh, yeah, I am Zach the Wretched Watchman. If you want to know more, again, head on over to my channel and I go even further in depth on this stuff with that Seven Mountains podcast. You can check that out. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks again for joining me here on Below the Surface here on Hope for Our Times. You guys have a great one. Peace out and Maranatha.